International Rugby returns to the Southern Hemisphere this weekend. The Rugby Championship is back. We've got two big matches coming your way this weekend, and today I'm going to be having a look over them and giving you my thoughts on to who and why each team is going to win or lose. There's got to be a loser. Of course, we've got the South African Springboks going up against the Australian Wallabies and the Argentinian Pumas going up against the New Zealand All Blacks. These two games being held in South Africa and in Argentina. Mendoza, of course, are the latter, and Loftus Versfeld for the earlier of the two games. So let's take a look, dive in head first, and see what's going to happen this weekend as we look forward to the Rugby World Cup. Welcome back everyone, it's been a long time since we've got cracking into rugby, we missed all the Super Rugby, but of course if you've been tuning into the channel you know now we're back, and now we're getting back into the action. The Rugby Championship kicks off this weekend, and I hope you're all looking forward and excited to having the International Rugby back. Today we're going to be having a look at the two matches in this opening weekend, like I said before, South Africa, Australia, Argentina, New Zealand, and we're going to look at the lineups because they've been announced overnight, this is a Friday, Hopefully we'll be getting this out to you ASAPO and giving you my thoughts as quickly as I can. So let's dig straight into it, shall we? Opening game of the competition. New Zealand time, it's something ridiculous like 3 a.m. or 1.30. It's in the a.m.s, in the wee small hours where most people sleep. Except for rugby fans, it seems that's the way, and probably football fans as well. Most of those people stay up all night to watch the sport. But that's the earlier game, and then a few hours later, about 7 a.m. New Zealand time, is the Argentina versus New Zealand matchup. So let's kick things off at the start. Of course, the first game is going to be South Africa and Australia, and we've got these lineups now as well, which have been interesting because we've already seen the controversy about the Springboks sending half of their team already to New Zealand for their next matchup, big names, you know, Mipimpi, uh, Mipimpi, Mipimpi, uh, who cares about the rest, it's all about the King, Marcus Ola Mipimpi, but no, there's about 13 players that they've sent over to New Zealand early, which says the Wallabies going, well, where the, why, why aren't you playing us your best team, you're disrespecting us, aren't people so petty these days, look Australia, what's your form been like, you've been crap, you've been rubbish, you're crap at Super Rugby, you haven't won anything internationally for ages, why should they take you as heavily as the, the All Blacks, like, really, to be completely patriotic aside, if you're looking at this from South Africa's to start standpoint, and they do this quite commonly as well, do the Springboks. They quite often send their better players to the latter matchup. More time to acclimatise. You've got half, over half your key squad ready to go. But we are talking too much, I guess, about next week. But the Wallabies are having a cry. And Eddie Jones is, is a media mastermind. I've not even talked about these lineups yet. And we've already gone ages kind of into this matchup. Eddie Jones is a media mastermind. And this is the sort of thing that he thrives on. He loves this. He'll be going, oh, yes, South Africa. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, what's an Aussie accent? Thanks so much for doing that. I don't even have one. But he'll be liking this attention because it's, it's taking the attention off his team. Not so much the expectation, although there's probably not much of that. But I think there's a little bit more alive in the Australian... Uh, media and the Australian public at the moment because it's a fresh start international season World Cup year they've got that optimism that that sort of thing only brings but Eddie Jones loves this sort of stuff he eats this up and this is his bread and butter this is the stuff he lives for so he's trying to pin that pressure on the spring box and say well you're disrespecting us you're not doing this and that um and it, it's, it's what Eddie Jones does. But the Springboks, to be fair, let's get into the real nitty gritty of this. Their lineup, they've already lost Oxen Shea um, to an injury, which is a bit unfortunate, which means they've had to bring one man who hadn't quite left, luckily for them at that point, um, and bring him in. So that's Stephen Kitschoff, who will come into the number one jersey. He joins Imbanami and Franz Mahalra. You can see the lineups, we've had them on the screen. Look at that, prepared for you now. Um, but the other interesting thing is, of course, in the second row, Klein, the former Irishman, um, back to his country, I guess. There's a lot of media about this as well, about how he always grew up idolizing Springboks players and never really did Irish players. But this is where the whole international thing is a bit crook, isn't it? Um, everyone wants a slice of the international pie. Uh, and this is a prime example of it. He's gone and jumped at the chance to represent Ireland, 
so that he can represent a country and get that international juicy extras that you get for being an international rugby player. Do you blame him? No. Would we do the same? Yes. So don't even beat him up about it. Now he's got to that level where he's actually, you know, not just breaking into an international team. He's actually a decent international player and the Springboks have come knocking and gone, well, you can, you can play with us if you want to. And he's gone, hell yeah. This is my optimal choice. So he's come back to the Springboks after clearly deserting them a number of years ago for the glory of just playing international rugby. So that's a bit of a contentious issue. Springboks Ireland later on at possibly a World Cup or something. Could be fun to see those teams and those players clash over a matter. Is there sort of ill feeling among the Irish about this is what I'm really interested in. And knowing. But back to the Springboks. It's so hard to get off track here. The rest of their team is a bit more as you'd expect. Yeah, you look through the, the toys there on the open side or the blind side. So everything's backwards. Vermeulen, of course, at number eight, will captain the team. The big machine at the back of that pack. The back line, though, does interest me. And he's experienced it at, um, in the number nine jersey with Corbett Reinach. But uh, Marnie Libok is his first start in a South African jumper. Quality, talented young player. Been around a while though, do you still qualify him as a talented young player? He gets an opportunity. Pressure will be on him to perform. He's got an experienced midfield outside him, so that will certainly help. Uh, it will be Andre Esterhazen and Lacan Arm at 12 and 13. That'll help him because those guys can both just go through a midfield. And if he gets in trouble, just give it, the, give it the bash. Give it to those two guys in the midfield and they'll bash it up. Outside of the excitement machines, Arunsa and Moody, they are exciting. They're like little Cheslin Colbys running around. There's, there's going to be 15 Cheslin Colbys running around South African rugby soon. That's all they're going to do. Just give it to one of the little Cheslins in their back line and they'll just go nuts. They'll just go crazy and they'll be sidestepping thin air, running over all sorts of piles of grass and tiptoeing through pieces of paint. That's the sort of players those guys are. Do they get enough ball, though? If you're going to pick a hole in the Springboks lineup, are those outside backs, along with Vili LaRue, of course, was a fullback to complement that uh, back three, are they going to see enough ball? Or will they see that ball from the Wallabies? Perfect segue there, gotta say. Who are going to be doing expectantly? Little to no kicking, I would have think, through Quade Cooper, who is predominantly a player who loves to run the ball. This Wallabies lineup is interesting. I think it's very, very interesting. They've got a debutante in their lineup and Tom Hooper. So we've got the Hooper Hooper combo at six and seven. Tom and Michael, that's a commentator's nightmare, surely through that one. And they've also got three on the bench. We'll have a look at the benches near the end of this one. This is a Wallabies lineup that has been, I mean, they've used so many players recently over the last few years, haven't they? There's just been a player turnover like you wouldn't believe and that's what makes the lineups unpredictable is because there's so many players in the group that have been in and out of starting lineups although when you look at it you say yeah it's, it's nothing really surprising there because these are guys that have been either in the team on the bench fringes around the squad for a long long time and I think that certainly is um, a big asset to Australian rugby they've built up over the last few years because they've built a bit of a group of players now who have represented Australia at an international level. So you look at this team and you go, yeah, there's not too many un-Australian weaknesses here. Just the typical stuff we're used to seeing with the addition of Hooper at six. And seven co-captains there with Slipper. Quake Cooper's a bit of a wild card. He must be 116 by now. Um, you know, he's really fighting up with LeBron James and those sorts of players. As the oldest sportsman to still be playing professionally at the highest level. It is crazy. The back line's got a bit of excitement. It's got a bit of uh, ease of players who are going to do things fairly steady enough for Australian standards. You've got the excitement of Colin Betsy, of course. You've got that brick wall meathead of Reese Hodge in midfield. And you've got a little bit of that Pacific flair of Lee Nikitao in the middle at 13 as well. Vunavalu on the right wing. Now, I didn't watch a huge amount of Super Rugby this year, but this is going to be a test. He could have played every minute of Super Rugby this year, and he still won't be prepared for what the Springboks are going to bring him, even though he's a right winger. Sure, he's probably just going to look at Odinsa all, all day long, 
but he's going to, if he's a real player, he's going to want to get involved. And if you get involved, you're running into Damien Mullen. And I think he's probably only going to do that once. And you'll go back out to Arunsa on the wing and just, you know, get to know him a little bit better. Uh, because that would be a wise move. Tom Wright's the fullback for them. Um, and that's solid enough with a little bit of excitement there if he can get some ball. And you'd expect the Springboks will kick the ball a fair bit as well. Because they are playing at Loftus, which will give them that sort of advantage. The talk of, of the Wallabies going for this fit squad that's going to run the Springboks around. Oh, don't, don't even listen to the poppycock that comes out of Eddie Jones' mouth. The guy can talk and sell anything to anyone, and he'll make you believe it. That is that is absolute garbage. The Springboks don't care how you play. They don't care what plays you're going to put out on the field because the Springboks are going to play Springbok rugby. You either bring it and beat them at that, or you try to drag them into your own game. The Wallabies, A and B, I don't think are good enough to do either. They can't beat the Springboks in their own game. I don't think they're good enough to drag the, wall the Springboks into the Wallaby game. What they need to do is just stick to their strengths. Try and beat them playing their game, but playing, playing their own game. Let the Springboks do what they want to do. You get the ball, just play your own game. Play to your strengths. You're not going to win a forward battle, especially a forward pack with those names in it. It's going to be tough. Rob Valentini's going to be in for a big night. He's going to have to do some big meters. They lose stuff straight away with what, with the toy going up against Hooper. Hooper is not a, a big rugby um, bulldozer sort of player. He's very quick. He's very agile. And that's a different sort of game. Wallabies play to that game. Play to outrunning. Play to getting away. And running away from their forwards is probably going to do you a bit more opportunity. But this is going to be tough for the Wallabies. I have no doubt about it. We haven't seen the Springboks enough. And those of you who are lucky enough to stay up all night and watch the South African teams in action in the Northern Hemisphere competitions, great. You'll know a lot more about how this team plays. I've seen a little bit of them uh, through highlights and stuff like that, but that doesn't give you the full representation of how good or how well these players are. Just the guys that are getting the highlight reels. So South Africa is an unknown to a lot of the Australian and New Zealand and Argentinian, maybe not so much, sort of fan base. But I think this game is going to go firmly to the home team. Um, it's You look at them and you say, they've thrown all these players away to New Zealand, they've weakened their team. But you look at that team and you go, they're not weak. That is not a weak South African team. There's a lot of depth there, and they play their roles very, very well. Speaking of roles, we'll look at the benches and uh, for the Springboks, they've got a fair bit of experienced players on there as well. The, the front row replacements, Joseph Dweaver, uh, Thomas Detoy and Vincent Koch. Wow. I mean, that, you could start those guys and you'll be like, man, that's just as good of a team. Maybe you'd lose a bit against Mahalba and Kitschoff, but still, international level, they're solid enough. RG Snyman, welcome back. He is a monster. Look out Tom Hooper and Michael. Look, RG is the absolute behemoth. Evan Roos, a good player as well. Dion Fareed, again, they've gone for those six forwards with just Grant Williams and Damien Willemser, the two bats replacements. The Wallabies are in for a tough night. They really are. The front row replacements don't do... I mean, you don't get that same sort of impact, do you? Against what you get from those South Africans. Let's just scrap and completely scrap the fact that the Wallabies even have forward replacements because aside from probably Pete Samu, the rest of them are going to really, really struggle to get up to the level that the Springboks are going to bring. The backs could be where they're a bit more exciting, especially Tate McDermott and Samu Karevi. Uh, Carter Gordon, he's going to see things he's never seen before. This is the sort of situation for Australian rugby that players are going to either come back from this stronger or they're going to suffer for the rest of their careers and not really get over what this could possibly be against the Springboks. So this is a, a huge occasion for the Wallabies. If they get up and they get even better and closer to a result, that could be the making of a lot of these players. Samu Karevi is going to be vital. And the question is, where does he come on? If you're going to bring on a Karevi with an Iki towel, that could be quite exciting. But you, you just got to remember, you got these brick walls of Esterhaz in an arm. Arm, a very good defender as well. But I think that's somewhere where the Wallabies could actually get something attacking going against this Springboks defense is through that midfield. 
the outside backs are going to struggle. The pack is going to struggle. Maybe Quade Cooper could have the, the, a day out. But you look at this and say, there's probably other options in Australian rugby that could have had something over Marty Libok um, and given them an advantage through those channels as well. Through the first receiver and, of course, through that midfield. That's a good portion of the game. That can really turn a game around. So the pressure here is on Quade to step up his match. So breaking this down as a final statement of who I think is going to win, I think I've made it pretty clear. I think the Springboks are going to win this game. Are they going to win it by much? I don't think so. The Wallabies are a team that regardless of how bad they're playing or how badly they're getting beaten, they don't go away. And I'll give that to them. They've got a lot of tenacity and they've got a lot of ability to, to stick around and stick in a matchup. So that will certainly play in their favour. Um, but I just don't think they're going to be quite at the races. They're just going to be stepping, you know, one or two lengths behind throughout the whole thing. And I think the uh, Springboks will win this one. But between 9 and 11, somewhere around that 10 mark. Let's just go in the middle, shall we? Springboks by 10. Moving on to game number two. And did I say at the start this is going to be a quick look at these two matches? Well, jeez, I'm telling lies straight away, aren't I? Argentina, the Pumas versus the New Zealand All Blacks. A true test here. A real test to see where these two teams are in a big, big international calendar year. Argentina looking at this, I think, for the here and now. They're looking home game, home win against the All Blacks. They've ticked off pretty much everyone else. They beat the All Blacks in New Zealand last year. They want to do it at home. They want to give their fans something to really celebrate. So let's have a look at these two lineups before we yabber on too much about what else this game has to offer. But for the home team, the Pumas, let's have a look at their lineup. So the front row is Thomas Gallo. Uh, Julian Montoya and Lucio Sordoni, a, a very solid, uh, consistent sort of front row for those three. They've been around these traps for a little bit, but not as much as Matthias Eliamano and Tomas Lavanini in the second row. So, bets on now. Uh, Lavanini, a yellow, a red, maybe both, a bit of a rainbow of colours for Lavanini. No, let's see. Maybe he's cleaned up his act a little bit, and we're not going to see so much of that out of him. Matera will wear the number six jumper, and we all know what Pablo Matera brings to this Argentinian side. While Martin Gonzalez is in seven, and Rodrigo Bruni will wear the number eight. Look at that straight away from what you know of Argentinian rugby and me. Put us together, you know, we're friends. Yep, give us that. And you say this is a pretty good looking Argentinian pack. And that's Argentinian rugby really bases their game around that eight pack of men. And it's a good one. I would not be disappointed by this as an Argentinian fan, especially when you look at what you've got on the bench to bring on through these later parts of the game. The back line, this is where we get exciting. Gonzalo Burtino wears that scrum half number nine jumper, but here we go. We've got the excitement of Carreras and Carreras at 10 and 11. Yeah, I skipped and went straight to the wingers just so I could confuse everyone. Santiago and Matteo will be together. 10 for Santiago, of course. He's been in that jersey for a few years now and really has been making some good, exciting improvements to his game. Becoming from, you know, that sort of outside back running player and then bringing that sort of flair of a 10. But putting them together, I think it's a, an interesting little package that does suit what Argentina wants to kind of play. Lucio, Sinti and Matthias Manoni will wear that combination 12-13. In midfield, Sinti's come on very nicely, consistently in the team for the last few years now as well. Bautista Dalgui on the right wing. And of course, who could forget about Emiliano Boffelli? He's at 15, and he is. He's a monster. He's a key. He's a massive, massive key to this Argentinian lineup. Again, looking at the side, you'd say, again, this is a very nice compact, solid, as expected, experienced looking little Argentinian team. And I think they're looking, of course they want to win this game. I've, I feel I'm stating the stupidly obvious they want to win the game. Well, of course, why would they turn up otherwise? But they are focused. The All Blacks, rug, rugby championship, but the World Cup is over here, you know, and, and they're like this. South Africa's kind of be like this. I think the Wallabies are like this. They don't even care about the rugby championship. Eddie Jones's focus is the World Cup, and that's all he cares about. I think everyone else, the Springboks and the All Blacks are kind of, well, we, we would like to win the rugby championship, but ultimately the Rugby World Cup is what we're here to do and win. Argentina is the opposite of Australia and complete everyone else. Rugby championships here and now, we can, we can break some things here and beat these teams in our home park. 
And that is memorable enough for them to take out of a season. They're a good enough team that they will still compete and they will make trouble at the World Cup. But I think this is a team that if you don't focus on them completely, they will beat you. I don't care if you're the All Blacks, you're the Springboks, you're the Wallabies, you're England, France, Ireland, whatever. If you do not focus on the Pumas, they will beat you. They are good enough. They are experienced enough. They've got winners. Matera, Buffali, guys that have been around for a while playing at an exceptionally high level and they win. And I think that's something that a lot of teams lose is that ability to know how to win. Especially Australian recently, the, the Australians have forgotten that ability to take the victory. Argentina know how to win and they know what that feeling's like and they want it so much more. They have that desire and that belief that they can do it. So look out for Argentina, not only in this rugby championship, but this whole year and beyond. Okay, so finally we're looking at this All Blacks team. And this is probably the one that's, especially here locally in New Zealand, man, the All Blacks are getting a bit of a, a, a bit of a, a poke from the locals or, or the, the New Zealanders, the fans, the couch critics and coaches, of course. A lot of criticism about the squad selections, a lot of criticism about who's in, who's not in, especially, and the likes of those. But this is the first lineup for this year. So let's have a look at it. Front row, Ethan DeGroot, Dane Coles, and Tyrell Lomax. That's, aside from Takiaho, that's been the go-to. DeGroot and Lomax have really stepped up over the last 12 months, and I think they earned that spot, and they are, I think, quite a big margin ahead of the other competitors in those propping positions. Scott Barrett and Josh Lord gets the nod in that second row. Okay. That's interesting enough, isn't it? Josh Lord, young. Again, that's the focus. World Cup and a little bit of rugby championship. Is that what we're seeing here? Getting him into that ability or into that atmosphere of playing international rugby at this top level and saying, are you ready? Are, are we taking you to the World Cup, Josh, or are we not? Shannon Frizzell wears number six. Do we, dare we say best of, the, best of the worst? Best of what's left? Sam Kane captaining from seven. I don't even need to give reasons for that one. You guys know what the story is. It's been everywhere. Everyone knows the Sam Kane story. And of course, Adi Savia combination at number eight. Yeah. He's one of the best players in the world right now, and he is going to go a long way towards dragging this All Blacks team to where they should be, and where he thinks they should be as well. But he's getting a lot of resistance, very much so, and not much support. I would expect a player like Frizzell to have the impact that Adi Savia does with his running game, but they're just not, they're just, they're, they're, again, different levels, massively. And the All Blacks used to having sixes and eights and sevens all up, big time game players, they just don't have that right now. Um, as much as I do like Frizzell, I just don't think he is international level ready. Or even All Black ready for that matter. Into the back line. And this is one which is good to see, but I question it. Aaron Smith, yep, he's got another season. This is his last year with New Zealand rugby. Going down a hill. He, he's not as good as he was a few years ago, Aaron Smith. But he's still up there with the best. And it's good to see we've got some youngsters coming through that are making the squad as well. Not this squad... But uh, there is some youth coming through this All Black uh, scrum half setup. But it's Damien McKenzie. What a fantastic season. First things first, let me say, Damien McKenzie, brilliant season this year for the Chiefs. He really was the standout and the leader and the driver for that Chiefs successful run to the finals. You know, they didn't win the final, but they got to the final. What they lose? Two games all season, a bit of a shock to the Reds, and then, of course, the grand final. But this is a team that's been led by the little man who's done a fantastic job. This isn't Super Rugby, though. This is not Super Rugby. And the other thing that I I struggle with, with having McKenzie here, and I, I hope that it doesn't come to be a factor, but he's played with the Chiefs all year and been brilliant. Again, he's been outstanding. But what Chiefs does he have around him? Weber? No. Any of the rest of the back line? He's got one winger. He's got no Stevenson, of course. Oh, no, don't talk about that. Oh, God. He's got Narala on the right wing. He doesn't have any of the midfields of Nankervilles. He doesn't have the wingers. He doesn't have the fullback. 
he's got none of his mates. He doesn't have um, his back rowers. It's a Highlander. Oh, he's got Sam Kane, of course, but he, and he's got number eight. He's got the Hurricane in uh, Savia. He doesn't have any of his mates around him. Does he have new mates? Is he going to get the same level of support? The, this international level is the sort of thing where this is your job. And I think the All Blacks live by this quite quite uh, heavily as well. You are the number 10. This is your job. Run the plays, kick for touch, defend your channel, you know, d just w whatever his roles are. But that's your role. Okay. Number 12 and number 9, no matter what their names are, they've got their own roles. And their roles aren't to cover your ass. Super rugby level, how much ass covering do they do? I think with so many young players and different players coming through that level, there's a little bit of ass covering. There is a little bit of it going on. I don't think he's going to get that in international level. Does he need it, though? Does he need it? That's what we'll find out as this game goes through. Attacking league, brilliant little player against the Argentinians. They're going to try and be aggressive. How much has McKenzie developed at international level? Not super rugby level. At international level for those few years he's been away. If he has, he's grown it, then this is going to be a good night for him. Outside him, let's talk about the rest of the team. Jordy Barrett, Rico Ioani. That's your midfield. Caleb Clark ugh, and uh, Imoni Norawa on the wings. Bit of pace out there, but oh, Caleb Clark. Have I said on this channel before how much I dislike Caleb Clark as a player? Not as a person. Don't want to attack you there, Caleb, by any stretch of the imagination. But as a player, ever since he's come in. Let's be honest here. Might as well talk about it now. Jonah Lomu was an enigma, wasn't he? He'd come onto the scene and it was like, whoa, what is this freak of nature doing? He's so strong and he's powerful and he's fast. And he was just so different. It took the world a long time to catch up and keep up and find ways to stop him. Now, that was the 90s, early 2000s possibly as well, through there. It's now not those years. It's 2023. Everyone has a, a fast, powerful winger. Everyone knows how to stop fast and powerful wingers. Caleb Clark, he's not Joan Lomu. He's not an enigma. And it's not the fact that you go, wow, this guy's fast and powerful. Get him in the team. He's going to be next Joan Lomu. That, that sits with me as well as a 10-day-old curry being sitting in the sun. Not good. Not good at all. I think that's what Caleb Clark is. Yes, he made a bit of an impact. But they get so found out so quickly, those players now. We've seen the Wallabies grab hold of them and go, oh, you're big and fast. Let's go. But it's more to that. There's a lot more of that. And defensively is another aspect of the game that those sort of players struggle with massively. Burn and Barrett's at fullback. There'll be more Caleb Clark disliking in future videos in future weeks if he's in the team. Barrett at fullback. Uh, can we ever get that Burn and Barrett, the one world player of the year, back, please? Could we? He's not the same guy, is he? Is he the Ma'anonu of this sort of generation? Rubbish when it plays for clubs, uh, super rugby level. But when he plays for the All Blacks, he's something else. So far last year, no, not not really the case. But we'll see what Bowden can do from fullback. I don't think that's his best position. I don't like him at 10 either. He's too slow on the ball and he really just sets his outside players up for poor, poor opportunities. Um, he's, he's not really much... You know when he's going to run. This is what I don't like about Barrett. If he's going to run, he hits the ball harder and he's direct. If he's not going to run, he holds on to it and he just swabbles along sideways, then shovels it on. You know, seconds doing that, defences no. And, and defences are so fast nowadays. You can't just dobble along. You can't be so obvious about how you're going to play that phase of the game. But we'll see how he goes at fullback and see if that's where he's going to finish out his career here with the All Blacks in the next few years. Or however long he's going to be here, you never know if these players... Let's have a look at the benches because I think I've talked about this game and the lineups enough as we went through them. For the Pumas, uh, Augustine Cleavy. <laughs> He's still around. He's still around and what a player he is too. Uh, Marco Vivas, Eduardo Bello. They're your front row replacements uh, for the Pumas. Pedro Rubiolo is in 19. The second row, Santiago Grondona is the back row replacement. Uh, we've got Lutaro Bazan Velez. God, I love their names. Their names are amazing. Scrum half replacement with Nicolas Sanchez back in the team. He'll be a big impact later on for this side. Matthias Orlando, again, another one, much like Moroni, can make things happen. For the All Blacks, we've got Cody Taylor off a of Tonga Fasi. Ugh, Nipo Laulala. 
I'm not fans. I'm really not fans. Tupo Vai, uh, Dalton Papeli'i, Finley Christie, Richie Moanga, and Braden Enor. Too many Blues players. See you, Dalton. See you, Finley. See you, Nepo. See you, Offer. I know he's a chief, but no. <laughs> Where's the Mighty Williams? Okay, you want to take a risk? You want to say, Josh Thor, are you good enough for the World Cup? Well, then say to Mighty, are you good enough for the World Cup? That kid's the future. I love watching him play. How he's taken this long to get into the All Black squad, I don't know. Maybe he's got some sort of niggle or something that's keeping him out. But I'd have him in there. Bench. Minimum. Bench. These young guys need to develop. That's how they come through. But we're talking about this weekend. He's not there, so we don't need to worry about him. Benches, big impacts. I think the Pumas win that bench battle. I really, really think they win that bench battle. They have great players coming on. Yeah, a few youngsters through, but so do the All Blacks as well. And the impacts of what they can bring. We know what the likes of Krivis can bring. Vivas is very experienced. Grondona as well as Sanchez in Orlando. The All Blacks, Cody Taylor, he's like Dane Coles. They're getting old and they're getting tired. And they're just trying to make it to the end of the finish line to finish the marathon. Uh, the, the props, not great. Dalton Finley, I think, again, give me Grondona. Um, and the, the scrum halves. He might as well debut someone there. It'll be good as Finley uh, Christie. Uh, Moanga will be a big impact, but so will Sanchez and Brad Nino. Well, it depends if he breaks or not. Orlando probably get my little nudge on that nudge on that one as well. So there we go. Who's going to win this game? Jeez, I've talked it up like the Pumas are going to win it. But I do think the All Blacks will come through in the end because I don't want to live in a country that's going to get burnt down if the All Blacks lose a game because, you know, if I get up Sunday morning and watch this game, I'll look out my window here and I'll probably see the local supermarket up in flames. That's not really the country we live in, but it's getting to that state, especially where this All Blacks team is going. All Blacks will win this one by four. It's going to be close. Closer than the Springboks and the Wallabies, that is for sure. Pumas are a good, good team. We'll talk more about them in, in future weeks and, of course, Rugby World Cup build-up as well. But for this one, two games, half an hour. Wow. I hope you've enjoyed this. Keeping it quick, as always, here on the channel, your home of rugby. We talk too much and we make no sense. That's what we do. I'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching. Week two, we'll have another preview as well. And maybe if I'm feeling like it, a review. Stream review? Hmm. Let me know what you think. We'll see you then. Take care.